Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's great to be with students, business leaders, and teachers to talk about careers in construction in the trades. As you know, this is where I come from. And it's not just the construction world, but right here at Spalding. This is where I developed my passion for the trades, working with my hands, designing and building things. When I went to school here, I took college prep classes in the morning and then would uh, go to the machine trades program in the afternoon. And I've carried the lessons learned here with me my entire life. After graduating from Spalding, I went on to UVM, where I studied to be a tech ed teacher and received my teaching certification. But in the end, I decided to go into business instead, where I co-owned a construction business for about 35 years. As governor, I've tried to make promoting the trades and careers in construction a top priority because it's so important to all of us. Whether it's building homes or bridges, repairing vehicles or equipment, doing the work of electricians, plumbers or more, these are all good paying, needed jobs and we need to inspire more to take this path. So I wanna thank the Associated General Contractors and the Associated Builders and Contractors who are with us today, as well as the employers they represent for all the work they're doing to recruit and retain talent, train the workforce, and do the important work of keeping employees safe on the job site. And with all the disruptions that might come in the years ahead with new technology and artificial intelligence, I can guarantee you this. Demand for hands-on jobs in construction will not go away. Some of you may have heard me talk about the need to end the stigma around the trades and CTE. For far too long, we've made going to a four-year college and getting a degree as the only measure of success. We emphasize that doing so will lead to the best career opportunities. But that's not exactly true. For some, it could be the right path, and if that's what they want to do, they should. But some of the most successful people I know come from the trades and didn't go to college. We need society to recognize that having a CDL is just as important as having a PhD. And while we're breaking down stigmas, there's another one we need to address. And that's, uh, that's the notion uh, that this path and these jobs are just for men. That couldn't be further from the truth. We need to focus our efforts on making sure women know just how lucrative and rewarding these opportunities are. And that work needs to start right here in our schools. Center Vermont Career Center is working hard on this and I appreciate their efforts. I also want to acknowledge and thank Vermont Works for Women, who we'll hear from in a few minutes, Ronnie, and for all the great work they're doing. Over the past several years, we've been working to promote and invest in CTE, as well as workforce development initiatives like apprenticeships, which Secretary Boucher and Commissioner Harrington will talk about in a few minutes. But before turning it over, my message to the students in this room is simple. Keep it up, follow through. Whether this is the path you end up following in the future or not, just being here and broadening your horizons will open up so much more potential for you in the future. You might not even, um, you might not have had to had this experience if you hadn't participated in CTE, which is why it's so important. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, because I've experienced this, what you learn here will follow you for the rest of your life in a positive way. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Boucher uh, to learn more about apprenticeships. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. I am so happy to be here to talk about the power of CTE for our students in Vermont and particularly the power of CTE in the trades. As the governor stated, it is so important that Vermont has people trained in skilled trades. The jobs are plentiful, the work can be rewarding, 
for people who enjoy hands-on projects and concrete, tangible materials to work with. And given the sheer need that we have for folks to do this work, the pay has never been better. So to students and families, there's never been a better time than now to think about participating in a CTE program to explore options, as the governor just noted, to enroll in a trades program officially, or to complete an apprenticeship. We have a critical housing shortage in Vermont, and it's going to take both an all-hands-on-deck approach, coupled with creative strategic investments to solve this challenge. CTE programs are and should continue to be a critical resource for trades training and the state's broader workforce concerns. I want to provide some information on how we're doing in terms of CTE participation and enrollment in Vermont. First, over time we've seen more and more eligible high school students participate in CTE exploration and programming. More than a quarter to upwards of a third of eligible high, high school students participate each year. This is wonderful. But what would it look like if all students had an opportunity to explore and participate in some type of CTE experience? That is a goal that we should all get behind and think creatively about how to implement. We know that many centers have waiting lists and reduced capacity to serve all students who are interested. We need to incorporate the need to expand and perhaps integrate better with sending high schools who have space as we move forward with robust CT options for students. Vermont also continues to see more and more students opt in fully for a CTE program each year. And these students are deemed concentrators in our federal Perkins law, which they might not even know, but that's how state folks talk about them. Um, if we dig in a bit further about who is actually fully enrolling in our CTE programs, specifically into who participates and enrolls in the trades, the picture's a little less rosy, and I wanted to be sure that um, I mentioned that today. So nationally, when we look at trades career clusters like construction, manufacturing, transportation, about 80 to 85% of students enrolled in these programs are men or young men. So only about 15 to 20% of students, therefore, enrolled in these trades identify as female. In Vermont, it's even worse. Our data show that we lag about 10% behind these national trends, with less than 10% of students enrolled in construction, manufacturing, and transportation identifying as young women. For participation in CTE, again, these are students who are just trying it out. The percentage of Vermont young women, women participating in these trades clusters is slightly better at about 11 to 13% for construction and manufacturing. So in essence, the national data show that we're not doing very well in getting young women interested in and participating in trades programs, and we have even more work to do in Vermont. And we're very committed to this. I will say uh, my understanding is that our state CTE director is currently at a training or a conference right now actually just on this issue and working with um, several CTE directors to figure out how best to entice women into the trades and other non what we call non-traditional um, career pathways. I want to acknowledge Jody Emerson here at Central Vermont Career Center for the work she is doing not only to model career leadership to young women through her own professional trajectory, but for stepping up to do all she and her team can to advance CTE and opportunities for students. It's truly wonderful to see strong leadership by women at CTE centers. The power of role models for women in technical fields, perhaps most importantly in the trades, given the data that I just reviewed, simply cannot be overstated. CBCC is always a fantastic partner in new initiatives, including most recently agreeing to take on a new project the state offered, which will involve refurbishing mobile homes that were flooded this summer. And this will offer students, and hopefully young women, opportunities to engage in renewable construction work and training, and to have hands-on experience with aspects of construction, electrical work, and plumbing that they might not have otherwise encountered through traditional projects, given the unique nature of these flooded properties. This is a great example of how students, and especially young women, can engage in teamwork, service to one's community, and entrepreneurial endeavors within the trades. I believe we're also going to hear about some other great programs focusing on women and hands-on training programs 
later in the press conference. But for now, I'll hand the mic off to Commissioner Harrington, who will tell us about some important information regarding work at the Department of Labor. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Governor. We're here today to highlight the importance of technical education and careers in the trades and the, the impact they have on Vermont's future success. And but what better day, way to do this than during Career and Construction Month? That said, uh, for those of us who work for the governor and know the governor, I'm pretty sure every day and every month is Career and Construction Month. Um, also, I want to give a special thanks to the Career Center for hosting us today. It's great to see the students here exploring possible career paths and building their skills. And as the governor has stressed time and time again, Vermont has been battling a demographics crisis for decades now. There just aren't enough people in our communities, kids in our schools, or skilled workers for our jobs. But it was the pandemic that put a fine point on this problem and moved it from a small state issue to a global issue. For anyone who has been looking to make repairs to their home, finally upgrade that kitchen of theirs, or for a business that's looking to expand operations, the shortage of qualified trade workers is no surprise to any of us. This summer storm did not help matters. If nothing else, the July flood recovery underscored how important the construction industry really is and the occupations that make up that sector, like engineers and builders, carpenters, heavy machine operators, CDL drivers, electricians, plumbers, and mechanics, and many more. In 2022, construction accounted for about one out of every 10 businesses in Vermont, about 10%, and one out of every 20 jobs. These companies paid out an average wage of roughly $61,000 a year, exceeding the statewide average wage for all uh, for wages at, by about 3%. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the National Association of Women in Construction, women fill only about 10% of those jobs in the construction industry, which is probably not surprising for any of us. It wasn't for me. This is not a new issue in the industry, but there is room for every person in this economy, including the trades. And regardless of how a person identifies, there's a space for them. And there are employers out there willing to train people who have little to no experience and pay them while they learn. I'm happy to be here today to celebrate careers in construction and the tradespeople that make it all happen, especially those that defy the odds and challenge the stereotypes. There is great work being done across the state to expose people of all backgrounds to these amazing professions. We're joined here today by Vermont Works for Women and a couple of the young tradespeople in the making, not just to bring attention to these amazing careers, but to challenge the notion that the construction industry is solely for men. I had the pleasure of attending the Vermont Works for Women, Women Can Do event earlier this month in Randolph, and I cannot tell you how amazing it was to see over 400 young people from across the state exploring careers in construction, aerospace, robotics, electronics, forestry, heavy machinery, and more. But it's more than just having women in the trades. It's about shattering age-old stereotypes about what, what women can or can't do. By supporting women and other diverse populations to land these jobs in construction and by challenging long-held personal and professional stereotypes, we are fostering a more inclusive workforce, one that acknowledges that a woman's place is wherever she wants to be, with equal pay for equal work, and one that recognizes the important role each person plays in our economy. To highlight just one occupation in the industry, the Department of Labor estimates that there will be nearly 5,000 openings in the carpentry occupation over the next 10 years, meaning we need to find 500 new carpenters every year just to keep up. The message couldn't be any clearer. To women considering a career change or a career path in construction, Vermont needs you. We need you and other talented and driven individuals to help build not only Vermont, the Vermont we need today, but the Vermont we want for the future. By staying and working right here in Vermont, you can make a difference in your life, your family, your community, and your state. This is work that matters. 
It's also important to point out that there are about 3,000 women-owned businesses in Vermont. However, only 66 of those are in the trades and manufacturing. So there is significant opportunity for growth all around the state. These are good jobs and great careers and afford people the opportunity to grow within the industry. Maybe even become an entrepreneur and start your own construction business, which the governor knows a little something about. Vermont is a tight-knit community. We stand by our neighbors, cheer on their successes, and support them in times of need. Let's extend that same community spirit to women and all students pursuing training and education in careers in non-traditional fields. On behalf of the Department of Labor and the businesses and communities we serve, thank you for making sure your choice, your voice is heard and for choosing to be here today and for ensuring that women, girls, and gender expansive individuals are included in the economy and career advancement opportunities in and across Vermont. It's now my true pleasure to introduce Ronnie Basden from Vermont Works for Women. Ronnie. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm Ronnie Basden, the Executive Director at Vermont Works for Women. I am proud to stand here today with Governor Scott, our Vermont State Agencies, necessary employers, and critical programs that are all working to address our increasing needs and our labor challenges. Women are a critical part of our workforce and significant contributors to the growth of our communities. Yet the fact remains that women are underrepresented in Vermont's fastest growing, highest need fields. Fields such as construction, electrical, weatherization, flood recovery, and infrastructure development. Talking about and diversifying our construction industry is no longer just an opportunity, it is now a necessity. We know that today, Vermont women have a 79.5% employment participation rate that very closely matches Vermont men at 81.9%. But the fact also remains that women still only represent 4.1% of shovel-ready construction careers. The opportunity is there to empower, upskill, and connect women directly to these motivating careers today, while also investing in the potential skills of our youth. Vermont Works for Women has been working since 1987 to raise awareness about careers opportunities, provide hard skills training programming, and connect women and youth to motivating employers and ongoing education. Our Trailblazers Trades Training Program, geared towards women and gender expansive individuals, runs from Barrie to Brattleboro, Rutland to Burlington, and over to Newport. Our Trailblazers Pre-Apprenticeship Training Program pairs the hard skills training necessary to be job ready with the support and the empowerment to retain and thrive within these careers. We partner directly with employers and our industries here in Vermont to ensure that these work environments are family sustaining and motivating. But we also need to recognize the potential and the opportunities in our Vermont youth. At Vermont Works for Women, we work to expose middle and high school girls to career pathways, training opportunities, and partner with them to dismantle the stereotypes around entering trade certification work or construction careers for women. Today, we, set it, we sit at Central Valley Career and Tech Center that provides an incredible opportunity for certification, skills, and education. But we also recognize that we need to increase our female enrollment in these critical programs across state tech centers and build in representation that naturally attracts the carpenters, the welders, and the workers that we need across our state. Increasing access to construction careers and diversing our industries only happens in collaboration. We are incredibly proud to partner with our Vermont state agencies to ensure that there is access to quality programming for all Vermonters who are interested. At Vermont Works for Women, we work closely with our community collaborative Serve, Learn, and Earn partners, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, Audubon Vermont, and Resource Vermont to provide paid service and training opportunities in a collaborative problem-solving approach to workforce challenges. Construction careers can provide a significant opportunity and tremendous benefits, but there is work to be done to ensure that women are entering these fields, that we are retaining their critical talent, 
and that we are working together to create a thriving and diverse construction workforce for Vermont. I am incredibly proud to be joined tonight by a Trailblazers graduate who can best speak to these goals. The demand for trades training programming is increasing across our state, and today, Vermont Works for Women and our Trailblazers program has graduated 132 women since just 2019, and we are hosting our largest cohort ever in Rutland. I am very proud to introduce our 2022 Trailblazers graduate and tradeswoman, Tiffany Marquez. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so my name is Tiffany Marquez. I um, currently work for Montpelier Construction and I've been with them since the end of last year. I really do thank uh, Vermont Works for Women for this change of mine because it was a career change. Um, I did not have a set path that was m meant for me or made for me as a female. I did actually grow up around contractors and builders and engineers and tradespeople in general, but I was actually never encouraged to pursue these um, careers, even though I was so interested in them. Um, so regardless of that, I still pursued with this interest. And here I am, you know, speaking before you all, and I really do thank the support, the people that really did all the footwork for me to get to this point, it was not easy, you know, especially knowing, facing, you know, I'm going to be in male dominated areas of work and knowing and uh, being curious to know if these companies are actually going to be open to having uh, female workers in general. So thank you Vermont Works for Women as well as Resource. Um, they both really did encourage and do the work that laid that path for me to feel welcomed happy and I honestly can say that I do wake up every day, you know, knowing that I work building homes and um, just remodeling and all sorts of really awesome things and I do encourage others who are interested to follow this path. Um, it is fulfilling. I literally just am so proud of even my colleagues and coworkers who are so forthcoming with their knowledge and just willing to be open and sharing as much as they can with me. So you know, break those barriers, continue going. And um, here next, um, I'm introducing Ella Townsend, uh, who's a student from CCBC. Thank you. Um, I'm Ella, I'm from C uh, CVCC. Um, uh, I've always known about tech, but I had never really thought that I wanted to be a part of it. And if you had asked me last year, do you want to build for the rest of your life? I would have said no. Um, uh, I slowly started to learn about tech last year and I seemed really interested. So I went to the um, shadow days for, um, for building trades and I really enjoyed it. It was hands on and it was kind of like a no brainer for me because I don't learn well being stuck in a classroom all day. I like hands-on work. Um, my favorite part about tech is knowing that I'm waking up and coming into my family. I love my class. They're like my family. And um, we all get along very well. Um, I would totally recommend this program to anybody that, it, that likes construction work. Um, I would like to carry this on for the rest of my life and go into college for construction management or business management. Um, being a woman in this trade makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel good about myself. I work hard for what I do. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I will pass this on to Richard Wabi. Um, <laughs> Governor, Phil, it was just 50 years ago that we were running up and down the hallways here at the uh, Industrial Arts Center, I think it was. And who'd have imagined 
where that journey would have taken either one of us. I think it's time to pass that baton to the next generation. And with your um, understanding, I would like to introduce Ben Osha from AGC, who is our new workforce development um, assistant. Ben, could you come forward, please? Yeah, it's got that Uh, thank you all for being here as we join other states, other associations across the country in recognizing Careers in Construction Month. But at the Associated General Contractors of Vermont, we believe a career in construction should be celebrated every month. One of the, <clears throat> one of the missions we are most proud of at AGCVT is seeing the outcomes of young women and men who choose the trades as a career path. Those outcomes include great incomes with benefits that allow them to grow great families, own homes, great lifestyles, and participation in our community at large. We know we have a tremendous need in this state for people working in the trades. We also know that for a program to be successful, it must include advocacy, elevation, engagement, and promotion. As the longest standing Vermont Construction Association, we have a rich history of advocating and delivering programs to help people get into the trades and keeping it inclusive for all. Programs such as the new CTE Experimental Learning Program that funds hands-on projects for students, a grant program to supply employers with women-specific personal protective equipment, and earn while you learn programs. We have sought to elevate the construction workforce by, by creating new leaders through professional training and creating a roadmap, a pathway to success. That's how people go from carrying their first shovel to running their, their own crew and oftentimes becoming an owner of a company themselves. By regularly engaging with workers, both new and experienced, we learn ways to improve systems within the workforce that will help attract more talent. <clears throat> Figuring out what motivates and drives talent is the key to our mission. Because they are what are driving our industry today and for the future, uh, finally, it's critical that we promote the industry and its impact on the world around us. These young women and men are at the front lines of our infrastructure. Clean energy production, health and safety systems, transportation, our homes, and they are also responsible for the important work on climate change resiliency. <clears throat> this association has the honor of growing the workforce with our industry partners both here at CCTC, C uh, CVCC and across the states at the CTEs and, and other various schools. And I'd like to introduce Josh from ABC. Um, for those in the industry, if you've got a name like Ben Osha, you're destined to work in construction. Uh, my name is Josh Reap. I'm the president and CEO of uh, the Associated Builders and Contractors of uh, the New Hampshire Vermont chapter. And I'm here today to express support for everything that we're talking about, but also to just um, raise awareness of what the uh, industry provides as an opportunity. And uh, we heard a lot of great things about trying to get more women engaged in construction. And one thing I would like to point out is, uh, is that there's a statistical fact uh, that there is uh, no pay disparity in construction. Construction is leading the, leading the charge in terms of providing equal and opportunity for all that want to come and work in construction. And we need to do more to get more women involved in construction. So I'm great that there's really great work being done by Ronnie and others to help increase that message. And I just want to say to all the um, people that are uh, out there that may uh, work in construction as, as uh, someone who's been on the job for 20, 30 years, talk to your daughters, talk to your sisters, uh, the women in your, in your lives about the opportunity that it's provided you and that there's great opportunity within construction as well. Um, I think we could do a lot more to try to promote more of those career opportunities that there are. And one of the great things we're very proud of here with the Associate Builders and Contractors is 
uh, we are providing a, a great opportunity and pathway to career development for carpentry. We have a construction career apprenticeship program. We're very pleased that we have many employers here today that are participants with that program. Um, this is an opportunity to help people get into construction that um, may have come out of a CT center um, and looking for advanced training that an employer provides training for. Um, it's a great program because the employers pay for it. The employers are providing opportunity for people to go to work and earn while they learn. And we've got a great partner with the state of Vermont Department of Labor who has helped us set up this program. We're very thankful to the commissioner, the secretary, and everyone else that's been very helpful to help launch that program. And I'm very pleased to say that we have our second cohort going in this fall. Um, we have a lot of employers that have been engaged with that. We have a growing number of employers that are seeing the benefits and opportunities that come from uh, apprenticeship pathways. And we encourage more people to explore them and get involved with them. And I gotta say too, for all the uh, young men and women behind us who are building this awesome setup here in the CTE, uh, great work, and uh, there's employers in the room that would love to talk with you uh, and perhaps uh, offer you an opportunity to uh, maybe even be hired on the spot. I know we got uh, Dan and Johnny from uh, HP Cummings and REARC respectively here. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk with you. They're very proud of you guys to see the work that you're doing here. And um, uh, you know, lastly, I just want to say uh, it's, it's an honor to be here and to represent the industry and help champion to be a partner with many of the other people that have spoken with you already today. And um, to help us bring it home today, I just want to say thank you again. And uh, Governor, would you like to bring it home for us? Well, thank you all very much. And uh, you've heard a lot today. I'm sure you have lots of questions for some of uh, our youth here uh, in particular today. And so now we'll open it up to questions. I did tell Ella uh, that she'd be answering all the tough questions you might have. So I'm going to refer to her when they come along. Yeah, there does need to be a balance um, amongst uh, educational facilities. Uh, CTEs uh, were developed, they were vocational schools back 50, 60 years ago. They were 100% funded uh, by the federal government. And uh, that has since elapsed in some respects. Um, but we need to, to recognize that they need to be on the same, same level as uh, the traditional educational facilities. And um, because it's a, it's a great career path. And when I was in school, when, um, when you became a junior in, in high school, uh, you had to make a choice, right? You're either going to college or you're going to vocational school. And, uh, and I chose uh, both. I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to go to college, uh, but I also knew that I, I learned better with my hands. I loved that part of the, the problem solving, building things, creating things. So I did both. And I think that the, that's what we should be offering uh, kids today, a path forward where they can get excited about what they want to do uh, in life because there's all kinds of opportunity out there uh, today, especially today, uh, especially in Vermont where we have this aging demographic and we need, uh, we need more people in the workforce. We need to attract more people. And we can do that through education. So. I'm, uh, I'm all in favor of trying to find opportunities for us uh, to get on level, uh, on a level playing field uh, with CTEs and uh, more traditional high schools. Secretary Boucher. Sure, thanks Governor, it's a great question. Uh, just to echo a bit of what the Governor said, yes, uh, we do have um, significant inequities um, across the state in terms of both the physical facilities structures that you've talked about and then also in terms of what programs are available. Uh, our CTE centers are also across the board experiencing some significant labor shortages uh, in terms of their teachers as is our, our broader uh, PK-12 education system. I think there's a few um, the report is fantastic in my view and has a lot of great uh, um, recommendations for us to consider um, from the state level. I think we, it's time, we have to actually solve the, fu the funding of CTE, which has long been a challenge and a problem. 
um, we will be putting forth some ideas um, about what that might look like to the legislature. Um, I also think that there is a, there's a corollary task force that's going on right now that um, focuses on um, a long dormant uh, school, uh, state school construction aid program. And I think it's gonna be really critical that we keep the focus on not just, as the governor alluded to, our K-12 uh, bricks and mortar, but also our CTE centers, because just as our schools have experienced lots of deferred maintenance um, and um, some real pressing challenges um, in terms of basic functioning, our CTE centers, many of them are in that um, state as well. Finally, I think uh, another piece I would say before finally is I think we have to really do um, some creative thinking around transportation for students. We do fund um, some transportation um, from the state for students to access our programs, but we do, I think, need to think a little bit outside the box in terms of that. Um, because the solutions that I'm talking about are not going to happen tomorrow, and so we're gonna need some kind of immediate solutions to really um, get uh, on that equity piece and make sure that we are providing um, relatively equal experiences for students to the extent that we can. The other thing I would say about that is that there's another inequity as well, which is exposure to CTE programs. I think the best way to get students excited about CTE is to start early with them. So we have some great examples in some of our CTEs having really robust partnerships with middle schools and high schools where they actually bring younger students, fifth and sixth graders into the CTE centers, set up some kiosks and interesting hands-on experiences for these littles, if you will, to really get them excited about what CTE could be and really start that seed um, early on in their mind of what what not only um, the educational experience might be like, but what a, a potential career is like in those fields. And I think we can do a better job of um, helping our local entities from the state perspective, helping our local entities kind of bridge that gap between how do you actually get middle school students hooked up with CTE centers. There's a variety of different models that can be deployed. I guess the follow up, that report also called for bringing, uh, in part bringing uh, the CTEs into the statewide education fund. Is that something that the administration would support? Into the education fund? Yes, funding that through the Ed Fund. Well, they are funded through the Ed Fund. It's just a very complicated model right now. So there's um, a portion that goes directly to the LEAs for CTE, and then there's a very complicated tuitioning from the CTE centers back to the, the LEAs, the school districts. But it's still coming from the Ed Fund, so I want to clarify that. But it is very complicated, and I think the time is, is, is now to actually really simplify that. And there's a whole host of downstream um, challenges with that approach in terms of pressures on the, the overall system. Um, and I think that we have some creative ways to actually really make it work. To address some of those challenges that you're talking about, how do you feel about a more uniform governance structure, like having a statewide district of just centers? Yeah, I think this administration, um, my predecessor opposed that um, and posed even to going a step further, a unified district um, for the whole K-12 system. Um, I, think, I think there will be a lot more work to actually focus on in terms of what is the best governance structure because we do have three different types of governance structures. In my view, it makes sense for us to start actually with the funding first, and then a, a quick follow-up would be the governance structure. But I'm looking forward to talking with that, um, with the legislature about their views on that as well. So you don't feel like that governance structure could help advocate for that funding and be easier for you guys? I, th I think they're two very related, very complicated aspects. And so I think we need to start kind of with either the funding or the governance first, and then make sure they meld together at the end of the day. Any other questions? Great. In looking at the revenue numbers for the first quarter, I don't know if the flood caused a bit of a, a decline in some of them or not, or if there's going to be ongoing decline in revenue as you put the, your budget together. And I assume the money flowing from the federal government over the last few years has diminished somewhat. Yeah, I mean, we've received uh, a lot of funding uh, from the federal government, and, uh, and that 
that resort that goes back to our cash reserves as well. Uh, we have a lot of uh, cash, um, but um, but I think it is going to diminish. I think our revenue is going to diminish over over time, and that's why I keep warning the legislature that this isn't going to continue. The good times aren't going to continue. Um, so we have to be realistic uh, about our budgets uh, in the upcoming session uh, so that we make sure that we don't become more unaffordable here in Vermont, uh, that we're not raising taxes. We need to, we're a high tax state and it's, uh, it's uh, difficult for some to maintain a lifestyle here, live here, uh, their choices uh, throughout uh, the country. And we want to make sure that the, the choice is here in Vermont. So we have to be on uh, equitable uh, with them and at least be competitive. And uh, right now we're out of balance. So um, yeah, I'm concerned about the revenues, uh, but uh, but we have to live within our means. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I had another, you have a question now? I was actually also gonna ask about this issue. In particular, the rooms, uh, revenues are down, the gas tax is down. Do you see a correlation between this and the floods and the dirt that they're gonna drop? Yeah, I think there could be a correlation there with the flooding. Uh, we don't know at this point. I think we have to let it play out just a little bit longer. It's not gloom and doom. Uh, we had a robust uh, fall, I believe. I'm mean, just traveling around the state, uh, especially coming back uh, from up north, uh, coming uh, through uh, through Stowe, for instance, uh, this fall. It was difficult to get through. There was actually you know traffic jams. Uh, they're backing back up on the uh, the interstate on 89. So, I think uh, I think we'll find that to be leveling out to some, but inflation has taken over. You know, it's um, we're paying more for almost everything, and so we're just going to have to be realistic in this budget cycle about how we pay for things, what we need, and what we want, and and differentiate between the two. Um, you signed a contract, not you, maybe you did, with CoreCivic for extension of the prison in Tutwiler, Mississippi. Um, Tutwiler's a long way from Vermont, as you probably know. I think it's, I looked it up, 1,420 miles from where we are today. 22 hour drive. Uh, I have a friend who's there, uh, whom I visited in Kentucky and Pennsylvania and in Mississippi. But his parents, his, he's there now 20 years, his parents have never made a visit to him at any of these prisons. Uh, there is a bus that goes back and forth to bring prisoners up to be released or to be taken down there, as well as showing up in court. Isn't there some way to somehow circulate prisoners back to Vermont so that they can see their parents or siblings once in 22 years? Yeah, well, obviously, I think I've said this before, uh, if we could house all the offenders here in Vermont, uh, that's, that should be our goal. Um, but um, we've offered the legislature a couple of paths forward in terms of upgrading some of our facilities uh, so that we can accommodate that. And uh, that hasn't been well met at this point in time. So um, we have a capacity issue um, and we just need to, to do what we have to do uh, to, to make sure that uh, those who are incarcerated I uh, have a place to go, uh, and and in this case, we have to send some out of state. But uh, but I would much prefer having everyone back in the state. Well, I'm not criticizing the process of the prison, just the process of not allowing the prisoner to circulate back into the Vermont located prisons, so that they can remain in touch with their. Parents. Yeah, yeah, it's more, and I'd be happy to have our commissioner of the. Department of Corrections uh, address this because it's more complicated than that. Um, different programming needs for different offenders, and some need more than others, and that determines where they where they're housed. Um, so it's uh, it's difficult, but uh, but at the same time, yeah, if we could if we could bring them back, that's what we should do. And if we could rotate, you know, I'm sure that they'll they'll look at that. But but he could probably answer that question better. Um, question about the, uh, the dams, the flood control dam. Um, when they were originally built, they were flood control dams, even though they were opposed by Governor Raikin and the previous one, Franklin Roosevelt pushed them through, got them built. Um, but particularly Waterbury, but also not East Ferry, was become a recreational lake. 
if the water levels could have, I'm not a hydrologist or a dam construction person, but if the water levels could have been maintained at the lower level, would there have been less damage by this flood? Um, I'm not sure that there'd be less damage, but uh, I think you make a good point. Something that I thought about as well, uh, some of these Wrightsville Dam, uh, Watermere Dam, and they're, they're great assets in some respects, but for flood control, if they were down a little bit further, uh, we would have more capacity. We wouldn't have to be concerned uh, during a storm of the magnitude we had back in July, where we were worried about uh, whether we were going to crest in, uh, in the Wrightsville Dam in particular. And, uh, down the spillway in Waterbury as well. Yeah, but I think we're more concerned about about Riceville. about Riceville at that point in time. There was more capacity at uh, at Waterbury, and we weren't as concerned. But Riceville was a concern. You know, it was a matter of inches in some respects. But then it would have just flowed over uh, at that at that point over the spillway. Um, but um, but we're we're looking into that. I know um, uh, Secretary Moore. Uh, and her team are looking for the hydrologists and so forth to, to determine what should we do, can we increase the capacity, and what would that look like? So we're doing, we're doing studies on that right now. And do you have any control over the uh, Marshfield Dam? Um, I, I believe that's that, yeah, under FERC, maybe, but I'm not, I'm not positive of that. Yeah, I, I want to start off by saying uh, this was a, a vision. This was a concept. Um, you know, as mo most people know, I'm from Barrie. I know the region fairly well. And um, we know, uh, and this has nothing to do with me f being from here, um, but, uh, but Barrie in particular was hit tremendously hard. When you look at the demolition, the debris, uh, as a result of uh, all the damage uh, from the July 5th flooding, and beyond, uh, Barry in particular was hit harder than any other um, entity, um, per capita or otherwise. Um, two and a half times the amount of debris was collected in Barry as opposed to Montpelier. And Montpelier, we saw visually how much uh, area was impacted there. A tremendous hit uh, to the downtown, but two and a half times more here in Barry, in particular some of the homes. So. When you look at the north end uh, coming into, uh, into Barrie uh, from, from Montpelier, you can see visually the damage to the, to the homes. So I looked at that and thought we can do something. I told my team we need to think big. We need to think about uh, something that we can present uh, to our congressional delegation. And I've spoken to Senator Sanders, Senator Welch, Representative Senator Ballant about this concept. We've kicked it around some. And, um, and because of the supplemental on the, uh, that was uh, included uh, in the, uh, the ongoing resolution, uh, there's, there's additional funding in that um, for these types of FEMA-funded projects. So there's some capacity there, uh, but we have to bring forward um, a proposal. So the first step, again, when I looked at it, I sketched something out on, on paper, something that I would envision to, to create more housing, uh, not just replace the housing that would be displaced, but create more housing, maybe two to three times as much as, as was impacted, and put them on higher ground in different ways, all different types of housing, whether high rise, condos, duplexes, maybe even move some of the, the homes there onto new foundations in different areas uh, up, up on, in elevation. So in a green space, that was important to me. As a gateway into to Barrie, it was important visually um, because you, as you come up through and you see the, you know, you see a lot of the history. You see uh, what was the um, Jones Brothers um, Shed, uh, which is now the Granite Museum there on the right, that's part of the entry into, into Barrie. And then if we could expand upon that, have some green space and some housing in the North Barrie School up on, on the top of the hill and so forth, um, it would be an economic driver, welcoming more people into, into Barrie and create the housing that we need and 
provide for mitigation, allow the water to flow. We need more storage capacity in the future. We're not going to be able to stop the water. We have to do something to accept it in different ways so that it doesn't do the damage that it did in this last storm, because it will happen again. We're seeing it more and more frequently. So that's the vision. It was something that I wanted to, to put, uh, have put on paper, Black River Design. Uh, did the work uh, there, gave us, you know, um, some sort of a, a concept uh, that people could at least look at, react to, and uh, we don't want to force anyone to do anything in this capacity. We don't want to force anyone out of their homes. Uh, we want to replace homes as needed, uh, but this is a big project. Um, it would be, you know, tens of millions, if not over a hundred million uh, dollars uh, in this back of the napkin type of projection that I had uh, had done. Um, but, um, but it's a big deal. And, uh, and there'll be, you know, now we want to present it to the city council uh, so that they could react to it. And if they are favorable, would like to move forward with at least in, in considering this, uh, then we'll have to have focus groups with the neighborhood and people at Barrie to see what they want as well. I mean, this has to be something we all work on together, but at the same time, we need to give something to the congressional delegation so they can go to work to see if we can get the funding for it. So that's going to be essential to moving forward. Do you think congressional earmarks could play a role in securing this funding? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, that's going to be everything uh, because I think in the, there was a, in this uh, ongoing resolution, I think they'd asked for $6 billion, which is what was needed for uh, FEMA-related projects last year, and, uh, and they included $16 billion. Um, so there's some capacity there, and we're hoping uh, that we can be at the front of the line uh, for a project of this magnitude. Um, because, again, uh, we want to do something big uh, we all have to be on the, on the same page uh, somewhat and then, um, and then present it to the congressional delegation so that they can do the work to try and get some earmarks for Vermont. There'll be a lot of buyouts and, uh, and then building and so forth. It'll be a multi, multi-year project, but it's exciting in some respects. I, uh, I, I think I don't think they can I don't think they can do anything for a couple of years uh, once they uh, once they retire. I think that's an agreement uh, that they can't lobby for any particular project. But uh, but I know um, he understands the need. Uh, he's been delivering uh, on those needs uh, for decades, and uh, and with his seniority, uh, he delivered in a lot of respects. So uh, we miss him in a lot of a lot of ways. Uh, as chair of the Appropriations Committee as well. Uh, but, um, but I'm sure he'll do whatever he can uh, to help us shepherd this through. Good time for maybe one or two more. Do you, do you have any data on the affected population in Vermont when the hotels are full and second homes are full, campgrounds are full on the weekend? Are we over a million? Don't you know? I don't know. I'm sure we have data, yeah, and we've been collecting data uh, because we have an incredible housing need, as you know, uh, here in the state. Our demographics are shifting, we all know. I mean, we started seven years ago uh, sounding an alarm about um, we need more housing, and uh, we're, not, we're not catching up very quick. Um, so we're going to have to do everything we can uh, because it, 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 it's all connected. If we don't have the housing, we're not going to be able to welcome uh, people into the state because we need more people here. The and, housing has been repurposed by Airbnb. Sure, and we profited from that as well, right? I mean, the, uh, that's part of the economy as well. Um, so we need to find the balance. Uh, we need to bring more people in, and we need to have uh, decent, affordable housing for them when they arrive. discussing multiplying this by five times to get people 
we need? I mean, what are the, I guess, plans? Because that's a pretty lofty goal, which I like, but what's the plan? Yeah, well, again, I, I don't, the question is about how do we get from 100 to 500, right? And uh, unfortunately, part of that is we just, we need, we need bodies, we need people. And, uh, and we, um, we have this somewhat stagnant population here in Vermont. We've been talking about that a lot over the last six, seven years. In fact, that's why I ran to begin with. I mean, you could see uh, that we're aging out. Um, we were, our demographics are we're aging. Uh, we're not bringing more youth in. And uh, that leads to workforce issues and, and everything else. And, and again, we need to do everything we can to bring more people into the state. Uh, a lot of that is with, I believe, with legal immigration. We need we need more people. And we need them now. Um, so, and we need other. We need again. Uh, the whole one of the purposes here today uh, was to to highlight the fact that these jobs are available not just to young men but to young women as well. And we've seen and heard from them. We need uh, young women to consider uh, this an option, uh, so that we can we can make sure that we're fulfilling the need. Um, but that's, that in itself isn't going to do it. But everything, uh, everything we can throw at this is going to be important uh, because we have workforce challenges. And uh, again, how do we satisfy that? And, and there's, it's not one single answer. It's a multitude of answers in order for us to get there. If I could, uh, Tom wants uh, from resource, but I just add that I think the, the CTEs aren't, aren't the only part of the capacity. Right. There's other parts where we, we are training adults uh, through intensive programs. We have a youth build program that are separate. So that's an additional part of that capacity. Okay. Um, multiple, multiple ways of getting there. But again, I think we need more people to come into our, I mean, look at Barry. When I was, uh, when I grew up here, uh, we had, um, we were the third largest city in the state at that point in time. We had around 10,000, I think 10,000 people. Today it's 8,500. Um, so we have eroded in terms of population here, and that was due to many different factors. But that, that, that's the thing, same way with, with Rutland uh, as well. So there is opportunity here. Uh, we just have to seize the moment and make it happen. Governor, my um, wife has actually expressed frustrations over not having clothes that fit her in this industry. It seems like that's a niche and a void that has yet to be I wonder if there's any emphasis or if anyone's reaching out to these manufacturers to make this industry more welcoming to women if there's more accessible here to folks that's more suited towards them. Yeah, I hadn't anticipated that, uh, but uh, it's a great point. And, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there and, and businesses uh, want to make money. And if there's, there's a, a market for that, I'm sure they'd seize upon it. Maybe they just don't realize, but, but obviously uh, we should uh, be doing everything we can to make sure that they're, they're accommodating that. And, and again, I, I think they could get some profit in it for them as well. Governor, as uh, Ben Osha said, they, we have manufacturers today making female specific uh, personal protective equipment, fall harnesses, uh, respirators, the whole gambit. And if there is some concern, feel free to call the Associated General Contractors in Vermont and we can put you in touch with both. But that is- or Maybe you can work on that. MSA has a whole line of female specific items. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you, students. You're gonna put something up? Or you